Hello, my name is Rachel Schrader and I am doing a PowerPoint presentation on the history of boxing, mostly focusing on the women's history of boxing for my Women in Recreation course at CSU East Bay. So, the big question is, why hasn't boxing been predominantly for the male gender? Well, boxing has been predominantly a male sport in the past because it was a brutal blood sport. Although the sport is pre attributed to the Greeks and the Romans who imitated the Greeks, there's evidence linking bo boxing to the Sumerian Empire, who lived in what is now Iraq at least 5,000 years ago. However, our present day boxing is less dangerous than what the Romans allowed. Boxers frequently die during or, af or after boxing matches from injuries. Boxers' hands were bound with strips of leather, and some boxing matches included the cestus, a weapon called, called the limb breaker. Boxing didn't begin to be legalized into the United, in the United States until the late 1890s. Before boxing, there was bare-knuckle fighting, but this sport was more popular in Europe. Richmond and Molyneux, both slaves, were taken to England to compete. Um, they were the most famous um, bare-knuckle fighters from the United States. Unfortunately, they weren't really recognized here in the United States. Elizabeth Wilkinson Stokes from London, England was the first recorded female boxing champion. The first female boxing match in the United States was held in 1876 at the New York Hills Theater and it was between Nell Saunders first and Rose's Harland. It had kind of a unique story to it, a unique prize. Nell Saunders got a silver butter dish for winning the fight. In 1904, the Olympics, women, the Olympics briefly displayed women's boxing, but it was more of a exhibition than a competition. And New York legalized boxing in 1896, then the other states followed suit, such as New Jersey. One of the standing arguments for boxing was that it was useful to young men in times of war. Let's we'll see here, this. Um, this was being debated during World War One, so of course this issue is rising up because of that. Much legislation occurred, such as the Walker Law of 1920 to regulate boxing as a sport. Even after the sport was legalized, states such as New Jersey still had anti-boxing and religious groups trying to stop boxing. Um, legalizing boxing made regulating it possible, which increased its safety and made it a really profitable business. Before I go into that, I'm going to briefly pause here and mention um, John author Jack Johnson. He was the first Ameri African American world heavyweight boxing champion at the height of the Jim Crow era. Um, although the 14th Amendment was ratified on July 28, 1868, he still faced blatant racism and segregation. So back to the profitability of boxing. The golden age of boxing was in the 20s. Um, th this big fight was Dempsey, representing the United States, versus Carpentier, representing France. Right here are 90,000 spectators at the Jersey City Arena. This is the first $1 million plus dollar gate event in the United States boxing history. It's also another first because um, what we have here is the first time in history media went transatlantic. So of course this is you know the media reporting back to France what's happening here. So although it was a golden age of boxing for men, it wasn't really a golden age of boxing for women. For women, boxing was illegal in many states. Um, boxing was included in PE in a in a public in for physical education in box Boston. Um, however, in the public view, it was nothing really more than a circus sideshow when women were boxing. It's important. I wish I could talk more about this. This is really interesting. Um, all the champs that and all the fights that were happening around World War II and so on. Um, I wanted to stop briefly and mention these male boxers because regardless of gender, they were really pivotal and important. Right, who we have here are Private Joe Lewis, we have Dempsey, Tani, and Bear. Um, my apologies with Bear's picture, I couldn't find a more appropriate picture. I wanted to find one of him in the military, but I didn't find any, any, of, them, any of that online anywhere. Um, so these folks were all world champs. They were huge, amazing boxers. They had charismatic personalities. A lot of them went into Hollywood, too. Um, Joe Lewis was a real hero. He donated all of his earnings from two fights to the U.S. Army Relief, and here he is spending some of the best years he could be um, 
defending his champion, um, defending his, his world record. He actually held it longer than any other boxing champ um, in the world. He defended his title for, I think, 11 years, three days before he tried to go into retirement. But I'm just too long on this. I'm trying to get into the women's boxing a little bit more. In 57, Buttrick became the first women's world champion. Here she is. She's the brunette. Um, between 1975 and 78, the first professional boxing licenses were issued to female boxers in the United States. This is really important because without this, they couldn't compete. They, before, before this was allowed, they, they were not allowed to box uh, professionally. So here's some important names, some important women. We have Carolyn Svensson, Kathy Cat Davis, Jackie Tonawanda, Lady Tiger, and Pat Pineda. In 1977, Eva Shane was the first heavyweight championship boxing judge. She's kind of important too because boxing didn't really have many female spokespeople, judges, r referees, anybody. It was just all men everywhere. Which, you know, there's nothing wrong with that except it was to the exclusion of women. Um, so Eva Shane said, you know, it wasn't the idea of being a trailblazer. It was something I wanted to do. It was a challenge. She wanted to judge men's fights because there weren't many women's fights, and she just wanted to be more involved because for her, boxing, boxing was an interest, and that's that's as far as she could go at that point in time. I want to mention Gail Grandchamp here. She's kind of the unsung hero for women's boxing in the United States. She was denied the right to compete in boxing in 1984. Um, she sacrificed years of her life to make professional boxing accessible to our current Olympic champions. Her court case also set the precedent for Dallas Malloy's court case to win in 1993. What Claressa Shields, um, gold medal champion of the United States, has said about Gail Grandchamp, she said, if I could meet Gail right now, I'd probably give her a hug because she did a lot for women's, women's boxing. I wouldn't know how to go to court for women's, women's boxing. I just want to fight. I just want to box. Here's Dallas Malloy, Coach Ferguson, her coach, and Judge Rothstein. They're all really important because I believe it takes more than one person to change history. The ACLU took Malloy's case to be able to box in the male only U.S. Amateur Boxing, Inc. to the federal court. Judge Rothstein grants an injunction on Malloy's behalf and then finally female boxers are recognized by the USA Boxing Incorporated in October of 93. In 96 we have our first USA Boxing four-day female amateur boxing competition. We see the membership for women grow from 340 in 1996 to our current level of 763 women boxers. In 96 this was one of my favorite fights to see. I was about 13 at this point, so that kind of dates me currently. Um, we had this fight, Martin versus Gogarty. They went on before Tyson and Bruno. Um, I remember Martin blood pouring down her face. Her nose was split. It was a six-round battle. Martin won, and this fight was viewed worldwide on pay-per-view. In 97, there really wasn't much media coverage of this. There was the first USA Boxing Women's National Championships. I wish there was more information on it. Um, in 1999, Leila Ali had her first professional boxing debut. She's important that at this point in time, a lot of the daughters of the great boxing champs came out and started to box. <coughs> she's, she's a pretty fantastic boxer. No, she's great. I'm sorry. She's a great boxer. By 2004, she had a winning record of 19 wins, zero losses. In April 1997, there is a hunger strike by the fighter Marianne Lady Tiger. She staged a well-publicized hunger strike lasting over a month. She lost over 30 pounds. The point of this was to bring some attention to the fact that there is just no media attention uh, on these events for women's boxers. There's no parity with male boxing. This is really important because while women comprise roughly 40% of athletes in organized sports, media coverage of women on the field amounts to less than 10%. And without that viewership, 
then women are forced to sell more of the tickets on their own dime, they're supposed to use their sex appeal to do so, and women deserve to have equal pay for equal work. 2001 is important, it's the first inaugural women, Women's World Championships. Here we have heavyweight Devon Kennedy. She earned the first gold medal for the United States in 2001. 2012, we have here Claressa Shields, the gold medal winner for the United States. She's the middleweight champion. Here we have Marlon Asparza, bronze medal winner for the USA, flyweight champion. Both fantastic fighters. I'm also going to mention British boxer Nicola Adams because women's boxers, it's not just the United States thing, it's worldwide. It's really fantastic. We're in this great moment of history where these amazing opportunities are being presented and there's parity for the sexes in boxing and it's something that is not really being paid attention to and I wish more people would pay attention to it. For Nicola Adams, winning the gold medal was everything she dreamt about and it's it's really incredible that, that women finally have the opportunity to pursue and actually live out their dreams, unlike some of the women we've seen before and some of the women who aren't even documented in history. And it's, it's a real shame. Some of the current issues we face are there's no pay equity per fight. Um, women starting out, they get about two to five hundred dollars per fight. Women get, sorry, women get two to five hundred dollars per fight, whereas men get two thousand five thousand dollars per fight. So they get ten times the amount of money that women get. But the truth of the matter is, is that they're both working equally hard. They both would bring in the viewership, as we've seen with Christy Martin and other fighters. It's just the fights aren't being publicized. There's debates over skirts. Um, the International Boxing Association believes women should look elegant and help to distinguish themselves from the males by wearing skirts, since all the fighters wear headgear. Um, Poland and Romania are nice. They wear skirts. Everyone else kind of says, F that, and they don't wear skirts. Um, Katie Taylor, for instance, she says, I don't even wear many skirts in the night out, so I'm definitely not going to be wearing many skirts in the ring. I think it's a matter of personal choice. I think if you look back to the 1904, women wearing the corsets, looking proper, it's not necessarily something that every woman would choose to do. and I don't think that it's something that women should be forced to do. Here we have um, we have Hardy. She's a champ. I'm crediting this excerpt of the interview to Hamilton Nolan. They did the interview. Marianne McCune took the photo. They're both really good. I can't paraphrase to make it any better, so I'm going to give them credit and just give you what they gave the readership, the public. Um, so in the interview, Hardy says, it's not even a question of whether they do treat women differently. Hardy's referring to the promoters who make pro boxing happen. To get on this card, they're making me sell a ridiculous number of tickets. I'm going to end up paying to fight. She shook her head and muttered, I'm a former Golden Gloves champ. I'm not just some person off the street. And so what she's saying here, she's, she's voicing a legitimate concern. We also have privacy issues. There man there's mandatory HIV and pregnancy testing. I can understand both viewpoints, but boxers complain that pregnancy testing is an invasion of privacy. We also have discrimination on health matters by non-medical personnel. Some people might find this laughable, but you know, for this person, this is something that she's wanted to do, and she's prevented to do so because of a non-medical personnel making a judgment call. She had breast enhancement surgery. She says it's nothing crazy. They're in proportion. They are gel implants. They're not liquids. They're not going to burst. She wants to fight and represent Britain. She wants to also help other women to get over this obstacle. The people who are saying she can't fight are the Amateur Boxing Association of England. And this lady's a former, um, she's a former model. Her name is Sarah Bluton. We also have for professional boxing in the Olympics, we have only three weight classes for women. Um, women come in all shapes, sizes, and weights, whereas men have four or five times the amount of weight classes they can go into. It would be more equitable to have more weight classes in the future. 
something that impacts both men and women that are boxing is brain damage. And also not just boxers, but football players. And it's, it's a real legitimate concern. Um, you have Muhammad Ali, you have other famous boxers who end up having Parkinson's and other diseases. They're finding a correlation in studies now to that repeated head injury um, that's inflicted in sports and um, long-term brain damage. And that's, that's unfortunate. So now's my turn in this assignment to kind of throw out some theories as to why there's historic changes in participation with um, women becoming more involved in boxing. Um, some of the more positive potential explanations is the gaining ex acceptance of female boxing by people across the board and support from male boxing leaders in the community. And who we have here is Crutchfield, her personal coach. He's, he's grinning here. He said, you know, I always knew I'd have a champion, but I never thought I'd be a girl. And you can see that they have a really positive work relationship here. She's, she's smiling and it's a positive thing. We also have a soldier, April Moreland. She was influenced by Staff Sergeant Quentin McCoy. He saw some potential in her to become to become a really big boxing champion. And so he helped her to become more involved in boxing. And sure enough, she's actually becoming a really fantastic boxer. It's nice to see people seeing potential in other people, regardless of their gender or their background, and just say, hey, you know, I see potential in you. Let's see if we can take that somewhere. Are you game? And then that other person goes, sure, let's see what we can do. That's that's really a cool thing. I believe also the acceptance of women in combat in the military has helped to influence women's boxing becoming incorporated in the, the um, in the Olympics, finally. <laughs> um, J.C. Fortin says, now it's official, but they were already fighting. For the same reason why boxing could be considered useful for young men circa World War One and World War Two. It's also useful for young women. Um, it helps them to gain skills in combat. It also helps other young women to see role models, to emulate them, to know that other women, and they themselves can be tough, that they can be strong. Civil rights and women's rights movements, I believe, had a huge impact. Um, Title IX had a huge impact. Not only did it bring a whole bunch of women into sports, it also increased the amount of female physicians in the United States. I know it doesn't seem related, but studies have been shown that those two things are correlated. Um, modeled after Title VI, which is the primary engine to eliminate racial discrimination, Title IX suffered initially from lacking regulations for enforcement, Finally, the National Women's Law Center sued to get them, leading to serious enforcement beginning in 1978. So here we see that laws and other, le other legislation, yeah, that's nice, but you really need to enforce them to get them moving, to make them have any impact at all. I believe media has influenced the perception of what it is to be a woman. I believe that Sure, there's, I believe there's diversity in either gender. I believe that you're going to have women who, for them, it's natural to be fighters. And I believe that they should be able to go on and maybe should be able to have the same opportunities as men to be fighters. And it's really nice to see um, one of my favorite directors directing the Million Dollar Baby movie. I thought that was a really great movie. We have studies that have come out um, discussing our men designed for dominance and bringing up the issue. Maybe we're conditioned to believe so. I believe that women are just as competitive as men. Um, however, what other people believe, what the public believe about dominance and which gender is more naturally dominant, I believe that's something that could be deeply rooted and something that could be tra challenged and may not be correct what we assume to be true. So what we have here, we have Click and Fisk. They argue that hostile as well as benevolent attitudes towards men reflect and support gender inequality by characterizing men as being designed for dominance. What we have here, I've um, kind of brought 
a a study and some a media story kind of next to each other here. Um, we have Woodward's study on boxing and why men become involved in boxing and that gender influence and perception of boxing. And in the study he says, or she says, men's boxing has traditionally involved high participation by men from black, minority, ethnic, and impoverished backgrounds. The traditional narrative of the sport providing a route out of the ghetto or from the wrong side of town to self-esteem and even great wealth remains pivotal to boxing. This rags to riches story is crucial to the heroic legends of boxing heroes in the boxing films, including the Rocky series and Cinderella Man. Boxing combines the aspirations to heroism, which attract boxers with the embodied practices and the daily physical grind of training. Dreams of success are, however, firmly grounded in a material reality of embodied social, economic, and cultural disadvantage. So what he's saying here is that people coming from a disadvantaged background are drawn towards boxing because they see it as a way out. They see that purse of 100000 or more dollars and they go, hey, that's a way that I could really improve my circumstances here. And I brought this um, British title, Hopeful Joshua, into light here. Um, we have this article on the left. So can Joshua really put his name alongside Clay, Frazier, and Lewis? Lewis? and this trouble article where he says, you know, getting busted for drugs taught me how much I want that Olympic gold. And it shows him kind of turning about his circumstances and his viewpoint here. And unfortunately, there is an opportunity cost where people sacrifice to work hard to further dr their dreams of boxing. And this may be to the exclusion of education and other opportunities. We also have, I brought in this article, this study, Gender as a Social Construct, um, confirming gender stereotypes, a social role perspective, popular culture, we know we've embraced the idea that women and men are completely different. We have all these articles and magazines, how to do this, how to do that, how to appeal to the other gender. They're so different, we need all these magazines to explain to us how to do it. But we see that with meta-analysis, we see that men and women behave similarly over 98% of the time. So maybe really there is no reason to have all these articles because we probably have a good idea why people do what they do. So as far as the previous, not the last slide, the slide before that, I want to kind of compare the two here. Um, how, how does boxing fit into ideals of leisure for the female gender? We have one of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s teammates, Tyresha Douglas of Baltimore. I brought this bit of an article written by Nathan Coleman Lamb. He is a co-author of this article with Gamal Abdel Shahid of Out of Left Field, Social Inequality in Sports. It's an interview with, with Tyresha Douglas as well. She says about the sport and her training, I don't get paid. She said, I don't have nowhere to go. This right here is my ticket out. Douglas, who grew in, up in foster care while her parents were in and out of prison, she got into trouble. She got into boxing through a compulsory community service program after she broke one girl's jaw and another's nose in a street fight. She said, my dream was to finish high school, to go to college, to take care of my mom, my dad, and my brothers. I stopped going to college for boxing. I gave up everything, she said. She's ch choking back tears. No one's taking my ticket. No one's taking my last piece of chicken and she walked away from this interview crying and we found out later that Douglas doesn't make the Olympic team and she has nothing to show for her efforts. And so the problem here is not pursuing one's dreams but the fact that these people are told to forego the education and the other avenues of personal development to concentrate on the sport. So there's that opportunity cost there. So I hope that for the for this young lady, she was able to have a safety net in place and either continue pursuing this if this is her dream or to go back to school and get her education or find another avenue of personal development so that she isn't stuck in an awkward, bad situation here. Here is a study on gender norms and beauty. and. The article focuses on, or the study focuses on, we can be athletic and feminine, but do we want to? And it really is discussing 
how women feel that they need to be pretty and in, as, and be feminine in doing sports. And that's more of an issue because if they aren't feminine and they're not considered heterosexual and normal, then they don't get that privilege or they don't get accepted as often. And so they feel that they need to perceive these standards and they actually do need to fit these standards in order to become accepted and to excel in sports, which, which isn't equitable. It should be about sportsmanship, it should be about talent, it should be about skill. And also we have this huge fear of being falsely accused as deviants, which I'm sure men also have to be concerned about. But then again, what is being truly accused as deviants? What's, what's this whole deviant thing all about? And what we're talking about here is non-traditional gender behaviors and stigma stigmatization. And this is about conforming to norm standards. Um, this is about being discriminated against and being socially stigmatized if you don't look a certain way. And that's not equitable. Everybody is different. Not everybody's going to look the same. This should be about sportsmanship. This should be about maybe teamwork, if this is a team sport, or if not, this person shouldn't be judged solely on their appearance or their behaviors. This is the part of the presentation when I start talking about myself, which is my least favorite part of this, because it, it just is. I just don't want to talk about myself, but I'm going to. Um, why didn't I participate in boxing before? Well, I'm 30 years old now. Um, before, for me, my focus was on time, it was on money. I probably would have participated in boxing when I was younger. I probably would have loved it in high school, to tell you the truth, but I grew up in an area where there really wasn't a public transit to a more incorporated municipality. And my parents didn't have much time, we didn't have much money. Um, we weren't poor, but we weren't rich. So kind of in that middle ground where I think a lot of people that are working class tend to end up in being. So most of my life I felt that my time would be better spent on activities that could increase my earning potential. And here's that comic at the corner again, three-fourths of a penny for your thoughts, the gender gap in wages. So I was always told to work hard, to focus my energies in activities that would be good for me in the future, but my parents were also, they, they were good parents, they also kind of taught me the importance of balance. I think perhaps it was just ingrained it in a different way to forgo certain activities to do others. So now that I'm 30, opportunities for leisure, um, I think I'm in this cultural mindset that if I have any spare time it should be used to do useful things like cleaning up, like taking care of my family, I'm helping to raise three stepkids, there's all sorts of demands on top of school, on top of work, and um, it gets a little overwhelming at times. And this is another reason why picking up a leisure activity I think is important for a lot of people to do, regardless of your gender, because when you get so busy, you get this tunnel vision and you forget what's important. And when you get that leisure activity, then you're able to kind of step back for a minute and to refocus and enjoy life and everything's not so urgent as it first felt.